Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. I'm sitting in the backyard and I'm hanging out with Keith Morris and Greg Hetson from Circle Jerks. And we're celebrating the re-release of their incredible debut album that came out 40 years ago, Group Sex. And uh, it was, came out October 1st, 1980. Such a groundbreaking record. Guys, thanks for uh, hanging out with me today. Really good to see you. Good to be here. Good to see you too, sir. You know, um, that record is just unbelievable. For me, it's a landmark album for so many reasons. I mean, it was, to me, ground zero for hardcore, in my opinion, um, because there, I mean, there were a lot of things and rules that were broken in making that record, and I thought it was great. I mean, just the fact that, it, you know, it was 14 songs in 15 minutes. I mean, nobody had done anything like that at the, t at the time. Uh, but I want to actually back up. We'll get into that part in a little bit. Let me, let's talk about how you two came together because originally, Keith, of course, you were in Black Flag. You did the Nervous Breakdown EP. And then you guys were in a band called The Bedwetters. Is that what the, the first thing was? Okay, Actually, well, what, what happened was Greg was in a band called The Tourists with the two McDonald brothers. That would be the Twin Towers. Yeah. And they played a few shows with Black Flag. So our friendship started, uh, I guess we would have to blame it on Black Flag. Yeah, because we would we, we found out that Black, we all lived in the kind of same area of LA, South Bay, and we found out by getting the Black Flag EP, oh, P.O. Box 1, Lawndale, California. We lived in Hawthorne, it's the next town over. So we would go stock the P.O. Box after school to see if we could run into Black Flag to beg them for gigs. But I'm not sure how exactly we met. But that's, that's amazing. That's kind of like at that period of time, it all happened. When you left the band in '79, um, you were ready to do something new. Obviously, at that point. Um, well, actually, <laughs> um, I was uh, suffering from the bubonic plague, <laughs> and I was just open to anything that came my way. And Greg, in Red Cross, they auditioned Lucky. Right. And you drum. We somehow bump heads, and uh, <laughs> coming out of our concussions or whatever, we we looked at each other. And I there's said, a guitar player. I know a there's drummer. a drummer. I'm a vocalist, and he knew and a bass player. All we need is a bass player. And you know, I mean, the thing is, Lucky he was like a jazz a jazz musician, right? Lucky played jazz. And then yeah. Roger joined, right? And Roger had like a classical training background. Is that true? Um, he studied at the uh, music conservatory. What was it in? Uh, Kansas City. I Kansas think. City, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. He so, was a guitar player. He wasn't a bass player, but he said, I'll, I'll play bass because there's two less strings, which makes it the party <laughs> instrument. <laughs> which is great. So tell me about it. when it came time to conceptualize group sex, right? I'm with doing the songs and they were short and fast. Uh, was that just something that kind of metamorphosized by you guys writing the songs and this is how you decided to do them? Or was it was it something that you consciously decided, we're gonna make this album that is gonna be like flesh and light, it's gonna be really quick. Tell me how that came Well, about. you said conceptualize. <laughs> and whenever the, the word concept comes up, you start thinking of the Who's Tommy or the <laughs> Who's Quadrophenia or the Pretty Things. Uh, SF Sorrow. SF Sorrow. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a handful of them. Yeah. You know, all genius records. Our concept, uh, we, we couldn't get into the concept because the songs got in the way. Yeah. It's kind of like get in, get out, you know, leave people like wondering what the hell just happened. Yeah. You know, hit them with Barrage, with just, with the, uh, you know, play as fast as you can, because uh, to, to hide, let's get the songs on and over. In my opinion, why I, I came up with these style that I play, so I didn't really know how to play. Get it on, get it over with, before they figure out I'm a fraud. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, I mean, obviously you guys are probably well, You have fans. two left hands. Yes, and three right feet. It's amazing. So, now I look at the record, so, Opening would deny everything, right? Which is 25 seconds long, right? And the longest song is Live Fast, Not Young. And that was originally a song that you had worked on in the early years with Red Cross too, right? What was, what was it called? Was that uh, Cover Band? Cover Band, yeah. Cover Band, yeah. So and tell at me that, about at that. that point, at that point, those guys like, oh, we don't want to be in a band anymore. And that's kind of when we, they broke up for a minute. 
and then we just decided we need materials so let's just take whatever we had laying around from other bands we might have been in and turned into circle jerk songs well, yeah. we, what, what 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 happened <clears throat> was we had a show coming up yeah we had about two weeks and we're rehearsing in um my garage over in inglewood and at, at, at a certain point in the rehearsal um we're we're taking a break and i'm looking at the guys and i say fellas we've got a show coming up we have eight songs we need to come up with more songs we can't just get up there and play for 10 minutes 12 minutes i mean we could have i don't think we were that smart uh i don't think we were that arrogant we were we were ready and looking and willing to find the party and we wanted to be a part of the party but we needed to bring, we needed to bring more party favors along with us so um in the conversation i'm i'm looking at the three guys and it's like gentlemen um you've all played in other bands have you written have you written anything have you written any riffs uh any throwaway stuff uh in in any of these bands and uh that's when the pot started to get filled up yeah and so we're we're dealing with all of these riffs and songs and uh me being in the mental state that i'm in at the time i'm not paying attention to red cross riffs or mongrel riffs or angry samoan riffs and so um we ended up borrowing riffs from some of our favorite bands which uh actually is something that happens quite often because yeah. there are only so many songs and there are only so many riffs and there's only so many notes that you can play and goofy shit happens it's fun i mean and of course in later years you've done some really cool covers like i'm out in the streets with doing just like me poor bear and the raiders and jack and shannon put a little love in your heart things like that so it was like why not later on of course you did some cover stuff so when you're talking about borrowing those those riffs i mean wasted of course you was on a nervous breakdown ep as well but there were a few other songs that you had had that you had started or written with, with black flag that you took with you right um okay. see i had started writing lyrics while i was in black flag but i i kept coming up against the wall which was chuck dukowski and greg ginn where, yeah like those lyrics aren't cool yeah the reason we did Wasted was because I wrote those lyrics and normally um, in, a, in a songwriting situation, the person that writes the lyrics owns half of the song. So I just figured I owned half the song. Let's do something. Let's, let's, let's make this more juicy. Let's, let's, let's make it a circle jerk song instead of a black flag song. So that's what happened. All right, so let's let's go back to uh, to the songs that you wrote on Group Sex, and tell me about Back Against the Wall because I love that's one of the tracks that I love a lot on that song. Well, we um, are playing punk rock, and it's fast and it's aggressive, and uh, there's a portion of the population <clears throat> that don't get it that they see it very anti-authority. Um, they see some of this music as a threat to whatever they're doing. And of course, at this time in LA history, now it could be going on all around the country. It could be going on all around the world. But here we, uh, we were experiencing problems with the police. And that would be what that song is about. Like us versus them. Yeah. We're cool, you're not. Yeah. That's amazing when you, go ahead. I believe that was the first song we actually wrote. It's like, well, what are we gonna do? Well, I have a part, well, I got a part. The next thing you know, we got like a full meal. Yeah, parts yeah. is parts. Yeah. yeah. Which is a cool thing. That's great. And it's interesting because if you think about it, there's always been kind of a thing that's gone on through the music scene with Los Angeles with the Sunset Strip and the 
right on Sun Sunset Strip in the 60s too. I mean, there's always been that kind of push and pull with the music scene and musicians and, and the police the, you know, the in this city. The LAPD right? back then was run by Daryl Gates. Hated punks and hated just hated, hated. Hated, you know, this, any counterculture and, you know, they were buying tanks and it was the beginning of the militarization of, of the police. Yeah. I think started out. Out the here. battering ram. The battering ram. Yeah. We wanted to buy a submarine. It was it was crazy. Let's go back to the recording of the record too. And you decided to do the uh, the record in Culver City. Tell me about that little st the studio that you worked in there. What brought you there to do the, the record? The, the studio that we worked in. Yeah. Was on the Desi Lu uh, film lot. Yeah. Uh, owned by Lucille Ball and uh, Desi Arnaz, who were I love Lucy and. Mm -hmm all of that fun stuff. Basically, it wasn't a real studio. It was a glorified voiceover studio. Yeah. You know, when you're like sound effects. And I remember one of the, uh, we actually had an effect where I got to throw an empty beer bottle against a wall in a hallway. I don't know if you can hear that on the album. Uh, yeah, you actually broke the microphone. Uh, which song was <laughs> that? I don't remember. You were drunk. <laughs> which song was it, Craig? It's back against the wall. Oh, it was okay. Yeah, yeah. You cuss, spit, throw bottles. I think one was yeah. a bottle. The other yeah. one was a light bulb. Yeah. There's, there's two. There's two breaking things. And one of them, he, it's like I think after throwing the bottle against the wall, let, try the light bulb in the trash can, with the mic, you know, set up, yeah. you know, t on the trash can. I think the hammer hit the the mic and broke the mic. Yeah. How long did it take you guys to record the record? Was it about a, a week or two weeks? It took a little bit of time because we would get rushed in after hours. It's like, okay, nobody's in there. Come on down at midnight, two in the morning. Oh, so you guys were kind of like on the back of regular TV production stuff they were yeah. doing. Yeah. Cool. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, how we, did were, that, we how were getting the we were getting the back door shuffle is what we would call it. <laughs> How did that? How did you know? That get we, we, we. There were there 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 was a period in time, I guess it was for about three or four weeks, where um, Greg would actually be at my house in Inglewood because all of our gear was in the garage. Yeah. And we'd be sitting around, and all of a sudden the phone would ring. You know, and I'd answer the phone, and it would be somebody from the studio saying, we've got three hours starting at five o'clock tonight. Can you make it? And w we always said yes. You know, then it was, the, the call would go out to everybody else. Yeah. You know, meet us there at the studio. We're gonna be there at five. And we would haul all of the gear out of the garage, put it in the back of Greg's truck and, and drive to Culver City. Question was, I mean, did you actually, was this, so since you were like doing that recording on the back of where it was kind of like after hours, I mean, did the studio people even know you were doing it? Uh, did you have to pay for it? Or were you, is it kind of like friends and favors and we, we sneaking bartered, in? We bartered some illicit, as story legend goes, <laughs> we bartered some illicit, sub, uh, illicit uh, substances for the studio time. Yeah. I, I um, would like to just say that it was a grocery bag of bunk skunk ass weed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, speaking of songs like Skank on the record too, you know what I mean? That song, tell me about when you, how long, first of all, how would you say, how long did it take you to write the initial songs that were on the record before you brought in the other stuff? Were those things that you guys, when you got together, you just started writing those songs? Did, they, did you, everybody bring in their own thing at that point? Or were you sitting in, in that rehearsal space in your garage and working on tracks? Well, what was happening was um, there would be two or three like songs, yeah. like structured songs. Yeah. And then the rest of it, it was just wide open. Like, what do you got? Greg would start playing something on guitar. Lucky would start playing along. Roger would start playing along. It's pretty organic. And yeah. then I would read the lyric. I would, uh, I would read a uh, want ad out of We magazine. Yeah. <laughs> we. That's right. When We and all, there, all those things are still around back then. Screw, a very upstanding uh, gentleman's magazine. Now let's talk about those shows. It's really funny. I know that there's um, some really cool stuff that comes along in the artwork 
in this reissue, which is great. But I've heard this amazing story about um, a flyer, like like basically one sheet that you guys are putting out, telling people that you were the punk band and you were a non-violent band. And tell me about it. who put that together. Do you remember who made that? That sounds like something that Lucky would have put together. Because yeah. Lucky was was he probably gonna... uh, the least likely to be the punk rock guy. We were nonviolent. We were more of a, um, our, our thing was more, we just wanted to party. We just wanted to have a good time. Yeah, that's cool. Now, let, speaking of shows, the cover of the album, the artwork is really great. Um, and this woman named Diane, I guess, designed it. But let's talk about the show. It was at a skate park, right? With you guys in the adolescence. And can you tell me more about the uh, cover art and that picture? Well, what happened was they started doing occasional shows at the uh, Marina Del Rey skate park. Yeah. Which meant that they had a couple of bowls. Yeah. I think Lucky is the one who said, let's get everybody in the bowl and take a picture. Well, I gotta say to you guys, I mean, you, people look back and even, even at the time when the album came out, there were a lot of people, even in that, that period, that reviewed the record and loved the record. Were you guys really pleasantly surprised when you saw how you were received, how people loved group sex? And um, We were very fortunate here in Los Angeles because we'd both been in a couple of other popular bands. So that made it here in Los Angeles, in Southern California, uh, it made it much more easy for us. But for the rest of the world, it was... It was a struggle. I mean, we'd go out and there'd be six people at a show, 12 people at a show. I mean, other than maybe City Gardens where I saw you, where there was the university. But see, that was much later. Much later, yeah. yeah I think the first time we, we left LA to go out to the East Coast was 1981, maybe? Yeah. At, right after Group Sex came out. Yeah. Two months, maybe the summer after it came out. And you know, we like he said, we were playing in front of 12, 15 people like in Margate, New Jersey or who knows where we had I mean, a we, good show in DC. Yeah, yeah, yes, but we we also at that time were asked to come to the East Coast by somebody that had read the press because we were doing really well in the press, but also had um, seen the decline of Western civilization, and that pretty much opened doors for us all over the place yeah let's talk about the tour that was actually postponed obviously with everything that's happened with the pandemic it's changed everybody's lives and it's you know it's it's been a rough time for artists for ourselves for our friends uh, not being able to get on the road but the exciting thing is that the tour that you were going to do is rescheduled right for 2021 and it, let's talk about the tour yeah it was like you know before you know, this this record was gonna come out in the re-release. We were gonna have our big comeback, world tour, and then the zombie apocalypse happens. <laughs> However, the zombie apocalypse will be over someday and we'll be getting back on the road and making it all happen again. Isn't that right, Keith? Wear your masks. Yeah. Well guys That's incredibly to... important. It absolutely because is. the reason we're uh pushed back as far as we're pushed back is because of the non-mask wearers mm -hmm. absolutely and it's important i mean if you don't do it for yourself do it for your fellow man for your neighbors for your friends for your family for everybody else the, the <laughs> way that we were going to go about doing this tour because we're older guys i'm 65 years old i, I don't mind getting in a van and driving for three four five hundred miles every other day, but I, I've done so much of that. It's just let's uh, let's be more precise rather than driving from town to town or town to city or city to major city. Let's just um, make this so we're not we're not we're not spending the next three or four months doing a tour that Greg and I had already done uh, dozens of times. That sounds and, great. Uh, so you something that also 
getting back. I was thinking about Keith's Garage and reissues and this and that. Since so we're here to kind of plug this anyway, right? And that's the yeah. point. Yes, we're talking about sell, it. Sell, sell, sell. Yeah. Part of the packaging, <laughs> along with the uh, the uh, the insert with all the cool, you know, flyers and photos, is uh, garage d demo tape bla ghetto blaster recordings from Keith's Garage in Inglewood. Yeah. We got a handful of those tracks. Yeah, so tell me to, about that. You get to hear us in our early inception of, you know, the lyrics aren't quite there or we're messing up or you might hear this, the song is only eight seconds long instead of 23 seconds long. So you get kind of the feeling how it all evolved. Tell me a bit about, about that and, and tell us more about what comes in the, in the repackaging as well. Some of the other well, stuff. Well, there's uh, an entrance to have There's a, a, a flat piece of vinyl. 12 inches yeah. that slides into a sleeve. Yes. That slides into the... Through the outer cardboard die cut? Yes, yep. there you go. Well, how do you put, um, we got you a put booklet. that in the CD player? Yeah. But as far as the booklet goes? Well, that. the booklet, Greg said flyers. Yeah. We have a bunch of friends that have been interviewed and talked about the band and what it means to them right yes and the recording engineer that recorded it that kind of kind of stuff i know like people like lars Fredrickson from rancid is quoted in there right and some other folks so that's cool i'm looking forward to it i think this is really exciting and it's really just days away so i just want to say thanks so much guys it was so great to have you here thanks for taking the time to talk about the record and we'll do it again for wild in the streets and that's colored vinyl not yeah. just black vinyl. <clears throat> yeah. All the colors of the rainbow. I don't know about that. There's going to be some bitching colors of the rainbow. It'll be great. Guys, thanks for thanks for joining me today. It was cool. Thanks for Good coming out. out with you. Awesome. Keith Morris, Greg Hetson, Circle Jerks, Group Sex, reissued on vinyl. Guys, thanks so much for doing it. I'm Matt Pinfield. We'll see you next time.